Hello, everybody out there in virtual land. I'm Mike Murphy. I'm the president of the Herding Cats Art Collective, and I want to welcome everyone to Word Wrap, another uh, poetry presentation for the holiday season. And um, I'll be introducing the program tonight and uh, cutting in uh, a little bit between the poets to introduce them with uh, with the bios they prepared. But I'm going to do some business first. Uh, I always do. Um, I don't need to tell you folks out there how badly the pandemic has decimated institutional art support. Um, but the Missouri Arts Council has done yeoman service this year and kept as many of us on life support as they could. And we want to make sure we say that we want to credit them with a great deal. Um, but really, this year, uh, our saviors are you people. Um, the things that Herding Cats is do that we're doing in the the 2020-2021 season, we're doing because of some very extraordinary support from you folks, our private donors. And um, believe me, we know in very real terms that it is rough out there. Um, and so we want to thank everyone who has donated and those of you who were really strapped for cash this year, but sent a letter of support anyway, we want you to know that those letters really mean something. They mean something when we appeal to the grantors after this pandemic is over, um, and because they proved that you supported us even when the chips were down. So I wanna do a, a big shout out and a big thank you to everybody um, who made a donation or even just sent us a letter telling us how much they wish they could donate. It all means something. Now, as for tonight, talking about poetry, um, the medium of the internet is really kind of problematic for our characteristic um, medium of, of of live music presentation. And, uh, you know, the pandemic's really just kind of handed us lemons. And so our decision was to do our best to make lemonade and let the internet do what it's good at. And that means that we decided to offer some great poetry via Zoom indoors on a cold winter night. That's what tonight's all about. Herding Cats is all about crossing boundaries with multimedia art. And when you think about it, poetry is one of the original gangsta multimedia formats. Um, because a poem, each poem has two lives. Um, it has a life in print on the page, and it has a life read out loud in performance. And every poem shines in equally brightly in two colors. Tonight, we're going to concentrate on performance, of course, but as you're all probably aware, these poems are going to look great on the page, too. Um, poetry is profoundly efficient. Poem has to do a lot with a little. It's kind of like the blues. Um, you probably all heard the old saying that a great song. It, that all a great song really needs is three chords and the truth. Um, well, we live in an ugly climate of truth decay, and poetry is a strong vaccine for that. Um, and do you all remember bookstores? Remember, remember those things? Uh, boy, I, I sure do. Um, but in the bookstores, they divide the prose, um, all the non-poetry, into, um, into fiction and non-fiction. And I've always found it interesting that no such division exists for poetry. Um, I don't know exactly what to make of that, but hopefully these four poets tonight 
will help us figure out why that is. Um, so I'm going to be moving on to the poets that you all came to see. Um, but before I do that, I've got one more shout out I have to do. Um, down in the engine room, um, there's a fellow by the name of Kevin Harris, our producer. And uh, Kevin is the man behind the curtain pulling all of the levers and uh, making the great and powerful Oz look huge over here. It's a huge job. And I absolutely uh, want to say a big thank you to Kevin because he is working his butt off down there, making sure that the people who are talking are going to be heard and that the people and in the audience uh, that when their cat walks on the keyboard, it isn't going to uh, cut the entire performance off. So thank you very much, Kevin. So on to the first poet. Um, batting in the leadoff position is my boss, an alum. Um, and I say this because anybody who's done organi uh, organizational um, or has been an executive in an organization knows the president is nobody. Um, Anna is the treasurer and everyone knows the treasurer is the president's boss. Um, Anna has been teaching Dai G since 1973, where she evolved from computer programming to poetry and design. Her poem, the Urge to Play God, published by Moonshadow Press, led to her performing poetry nationally and internationally. St. Louis's first poet laureate, Michael Castro, included Anna's poem, Sitting Down for Yourself, in his new anthology, Crossing the Divide. Anna volunteers excessively on numerous arts boards, and she was named St. Louis Woman of Achievement in Cultural Awareness in 2002. And um, rather too modestly, Anna did not mention in her bio that she has created and published a 250 page compendium of her poetry titled Even the Celery Flies, and that will be available uh, it's available now uh, for sale, but those are pre-orders and it will be available and shipping by the end of 2020. So I want you all to check that out. So with no further ado, ladies and gentlemen, an alum. Okay. Have I been have I been talking to nobody? Okay, let me start over again. Sorry about that. I forgot to unmute myself. Um, you saw the book already. I showed it to you here. The artwork is by Lenny McElwee, and it's a collage that she gave to us many years ago. It's been hanging in our living room for many years, and I always loved it so much that I decided to use it as the cover for the poems I've been writing since 1970s. Anyway, so it's finally being published and will be available very soon, right? But I, I do have breaking news that um, I just heard that Sundance Film Festival has announced that <clears throat> my daughter, Debbie Lum, her new documentary will be premiered at Sundance Saturday January 30th, 19, uh, 2021, and also be shown again on Monday, the February 1st. So I am so proud of my daughter and I just want everybody to know that uh, that's happened. Okay, 
And since, because of COVID and everybody's social distancing and everything, we are not traveling for the holidays. So instead of seeing all our grandchildren and between Rich and me, we have 13 of them. I have 13 poems about my grandchildren that I will read tonight. And I will start with the youngest one and go in age order. So, in her head for Anna, little Anna. <laughs> Other toddlers wake up, cry for their mother, not Anna, busy in her crib, talking with all the folks in her head. In time, with pencil and paper, the figures appear. She's narrating their story to herself. Her generosity knows no end. Little Anna was happy to give her iPad to her namesake for the kudo board her mother and aunties made for her papa's 80th Zoom birthday party. Born shy, she learned from her big sis. Now she reads aloud to the class as if she's narrating her own story. Will she too become like her mother, a brown educated filmmaker? So she's the youngest. The next one, all dressed to go for Dee Dee. I met him at seven, though I never knew, is he four or is he 20? Dressed in his blazer, tie, and white shirt, he's ready to go out to dinner. That morning, we two were home alone. He loves bacon. Want to cook with me? Frying pan heats as he separates three strips. Now he flips them carefully again, again. When they look close to done, remove them to a paper towel, drain the oil, and he's cooked breakfast. Seven years in an orphanage is hard to overcome. The fight for survival, long ingrained, takes time to shed in a safe and loving home. Small miracles for Nina. What if you saw a woman with her, with her calf purple black from knee to toe, instructed her to push just below her knee the three mile point and bubbling spring on the bottom of her foot? Blink your eye, her calf turns pink. What if you were wheeling a 23 month old in a stroller at an angle of 45 degrees? You must be in San Francisco, loaded with milk and tangerines. When a car whizzes by honking, honking, you look back, the driver gesticulating wildly. What's his beef? Till you spot your favorite glove in the middle of the street nearly orphaned. What if you were a child from a tropical clime, now inside California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco, another town not known for snow, but every morning at 11, snowflakes do fall indoors from high domed ceilings landing on tongues and eyelashes, turning green lunch tables white. All these small miracles fade, watching that 23 month old master the art of peeling. From the first impatient bite into orange skin, juice gushing down her chin, learning the bitter lesson Nine tangerines later, she's lifting off the skin in dots and dashes and plucking each section piece by piece 
into her mouth, not dripping. Ain't life grand. Okay, the next one is for Starbright. It's Starbright for Cora. When you are born less than 18 months after your big sister, it's hard to catch up to her height. Always shorter, Cora makes her presence known with intention. Marching in the town parade, acting on stage, achieving her Taekwondo first degree black belt. You know, Cora is there. Papa and I arrive in Nebraska after a long eight hour drive. Cora grabs my hand, leads me to her Barbie doll Haven, where we play to her heart's content. And I, never having had a doll, make up for lost time. Now she deals for life with sugar, with blood sugar levels, self injections like a pro, replaced next by an insulin pump. And she grows in the world, writes an appreciation letter to the outgoing president when she was just six, framed on her wall, a reply letter, hand signed by President Obama. And bright star for Sophia. Endowed from birth with brains. Kindergarten at four, counting on her fingers, Papa asked, can you see your hand in your head? She nodded yes. Count there instead. So she did. Unafraid to speak her mind in conservative red Nebraska. Her blue views may turn friends purple in York. Not limited to her head, her Taekwondo first degree black belt sent her skydiving at 11 indoors in Chicago braving 120 mile per hour winds like a walk in the park. Irish dancer for Matea. Not an Irish bone in her body, billowing with strong intentions in the NICU. Less than 24 hours after birth, I watch her flip from back to stomach all three pounds and nine ounces. By the age of six, Irish dancing seeped into her bones. She's been dancing ever since. Steel springs for muscle, leap her to nationals all over the States and also Vancouver. Even bars in Boulder every St. Patrick's Day till COVID-19 put us all on hold. Searching for new worlds for Alex. Exploring with his feet, dashing out elevators in Japan, checking outdoor plazas in Spain, focusing later on his hands, creating new origami worlds in the public library in St. Louis. Now he has gone digital, disappearing into his room. And next one. Open for Magnus. Open arms grow from an open heart. This toddler greets strangers as lifelong friends. Come play with me, makes everyone feel included. Now, taller than all of us, his open mouth regaled with tales of unearthly fantasy, filling the room with constructions of his mind, 
soon we hope with constructions of his hands good enough to eat. Strong for Fifi. Mature, way beyond her age, this nine-year-old chaperones her family, 60 plus years older in Alaska. Dwarfed by majestic beauty, bear cubs, and porcupine. Flowers bloom grand with sun 24 hours. The glass dome train her great aunt Joyce scheduled arrived Seward. 50 steps up the hill, our hotel awaits. Strong from birth, Fifi insists, carries our bags up the steep steps, at least two trips. Every night at dinner, her phone records her food so she can share with mom. On the flat fields of Seward, she and Grandpa Rich biked with glee, inspired me at 70 to escape finally childhood trauma and ride her two-wheeler. Synchronized swimming grew her stronger still. Her competition routine with Caroline reeled with such beauty and grace, my eyes, usually a mask, now teared freely. Her life at Harvard, work on the Crimson, now on hold, thanks to COVID-19. Bare essentials for Jared. In the bedroom hangs a nude torso, breasts shooting up, tipped with purple-brown peaks. Beside the nudes who usually hang out and for quite a few decades. The paintings by my daughter from college days. My grandson has played in this room for seven years, now eight. He looks at me askance, glances at the nude. Isn't that kind of inappropriate? Oh no, I declare. There's no better place to bear yourself. Besides, boys are always curious. Beneath our clothes, girls are pretty much the same. Some boobs droop more than others. With more than bare essentials, his questions have landed him an A plus college scholarship and EMT career. Surprise for Zaf. When your mother was busy giving birth to your baby sis, I flew to California to sit in. Dropping your big sis off at preschool, you, not yet three, directed the way. Partial to exploring, later to your chagrin, I chose a new route taught you my favorite lesson. If there's one way, there are 10,000. You were so fond of trains and numbers counted from one to 10. We worked on 11 and up. You would not repeat aloud till the day I was leaving. You surprised me shouting 11 to 20. Parting at the airport, your tears swelled my heart. We thought you a spoiled kid, crying before dinner, demanding a particular chair. Now we learn. There was a wood pattern you loved, but couldn't yet describe. So much energy you exerted, sat down, fell, face first, asleep into your dinner. Always full of surprises. High school senior, you shot up to six feet tall. When I borrowed your car, you filled it with gas. Suddenly, you were graduating from Caltech. I 
a late learner, first baked bread at 70, shared with you Jim Leahy's no need bread recipe. Now you're doubling the recipe to feed your five housemates before starting work at Facebook. And the gap for Aida, taking a gap year between high school and college, taking a gap between college and Johns Hopkins Med School. She knows how to take her time to smile, born to be happy, to discover distant lands, Spain, India, Italy, alone, no fear. She lives my dreams, a degree from Wellesley that didn't accept me. My SATs didn't match her 800. An organizer at heart, I watched her in action, attacking the room she shares with her sister. Zip, the place finds order while her sister daydreams. My sister, her great aunt, moved to assisted living. She was there again with my entire family to clear a lifetime from a house, what to pitch, what to save. I see no gap in Aida's heart. And for my the oldest grandson, grandchild, <laughs> silent hero for Michael. We had heard of his exploits, caring for his sick mom. At seven, he saved our wedding, rescuing rings frozen in the ring bearer's three-year-old hands. Later, we saw him in action again at 13 in Japan with our grandkids, 19 months old, darting fast, the elevator closing. Our oldest grandson, Michael, stuck out his foot, caught Alex escaping down the hall. That's not all. Crystal stemware, orange juice, 19 month twins, recipe for disaster, averted by Michael. Solving problems with grace and generosity. Now a chemist at Pfizer, COVID-19, watch out. Okay, that's it for me. And Michael, you're up. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. <laughs> Next up, we have Jill Evans, AKA Jill Evans Petzl. Jill's had a long career making documentary films and media art from a female perspective. She's won four Emmy Awards. Working in multiple disciplines, Jill focuses on social justice issues from a female-centered perspective. Her documentary topics range from preventing spouse and child abuse to immigrant and female prisoners' rights. Her multimedia installations have concentrated on patriarchal dominance throughout India and Southeast Asia. She holds a degree in philosophy and started her ambidextrous career in her 40s while raising three young children as a single mother. Now, in her 70s, she is publishing the poetry that she's been writing all her life. Her work has appeared in the Tipton Poetry Journal, Light, a journal of photography and poetry, the London Reader, the first literary review East. She won first prize in the 2020 Lescaux Poetry Review this year. Ladies and gentlemen, Jill Petzl. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm so grateful to Anna for organizing this reading. Hers is such a generous and humble way to celebrate the release 
of her newest volume of poetry, life's volume of her writings. Anna, I'm so proud to be a part of this. It's probably important to point out, you have likely already wondered why I'm reading tonight while lying down. For about five months now, I've been recovering from two stress fractures in my spine, making it very painful to stand or even to sit. I never realized how important sitting is to living a normal, practical life. Think about it, how often you sit. Think about eating your food lying down and you can't see it because it's resting on your chest. I miss seeing my food. So while I am incapacitated, my computer is resting on my stomach, propped against my bent knees. From this horizontal position, I'm able to recognize the huge gratitude I feel for just feeling alive, for feeling the here and now of the world and feeling so well pampered by my family and friends. I think we are all also here tonight to borrow one of T.S. Eliot's famous lines, to dare to disturb the universe with music and the meaning of our words. I love the alchemy that makes song out of the bond between narrative, language, and silence. Behind every line I write, I harbor the desire to pause the ordinary world, to wrap language around the wonder I feel in those tiny, subtle, invisible moments we all experience, sometimes to speak the unspeakable, sometimes to take those life stories that seem commonplace and unlock new meanings in them, transforming them, layering them with sound and awe. For me, that's where it starts, like this first poem I wanna to read to you. This was published in the first Literary Review East back in 2018, which is when I first began to dare to publish my poetry. It's called Embryos. Poems are bodies that gestate and grow slow, arms and legs to do things. Their ears develop first. Their hearts come to life at the end. Looking back over many, many years of writing poetry, I find it is the unexpected tender moments that seem most often to shape the embryos of my poems. I'm gonna read six more for you tonight. Here are four of them I wrote, and I read with thankfulness for how my family inspires those embryos. I guess it begins with my mother. This poem is called Fallen for my mother. I don't know how that wine goblet survived out there night after night through all the days or how it got flung and stayed in one piece, a wild bubble nestled in green when people walked past under that skinny tree by the road, or why the glass itself never burst wide open with rainbows hidden in dew in the overgrown long clumping around it. I couldn't tell who it belonged to or how it got lined with those sloppy streaks down its sides like tears smudged too wide to be real. Who knows if the goblet had been half empty or half full, its rimmed openness transparent as need, as if an unbeloved lifetime were still swirling inside. When I finally brought it home, those dirty streaks turned personal and stubborn as grit. How I washed it and washed it to get it clean as new once again, odd. How I couldn't be sure if that goblet was pure plastic or if it once rang clear and keen 
as rare crystal. It's just that that orphaned glass was so sturdy, it seemed to be made of woman. The next poem is about another generation, my daughter and her three children. As I wrote it, I kept hearing one of my favorite lines of one of my favorite philosophers, Nietzsche, pulling me onward. The line I heard was, life wants to climb and in climbing overcome itself by Frederick Nietzsche. This poem was published in the Tipton Poetry Journal. It's called Gordian Knots. Just after she leaves me, I keep wanting to tell my grown daughter more things, but then they keep slipping away. My best intentions don't have the same staying power as picking up my grandchildren's toys, fitting the Parcheesi box back in his box, first folded in half, then halfway again, a board like memory, or salvaging the cardboard puzzles four corners like stray shards, so the fairy princess will be restored to her long ago kingdom the next time. After she drove from our home today, herding her kids into her van, I waved my daughter away, chucking hands full of kisses like cartoon confetti. And then I wanted to phone her about something almost essential as she rushed to my ex-husband's house to his turn for chaos, for sticky children, for midsummer boredom and what spins out in its heat, for the happy and hungry and trample of everyone's climb. I'm usually relieved when they've gone. My house lies in wait for a horde of reminiscences to absorb me in the silent, discarded stuff on the floors, the tug and tussle of it all left behind entangled shags of the rugs. And then I catch sight of a new brain teaser toy I had meant to give them, a bright red and blue puzzle of a Gordian knot still safely encased in its plastic, its ageless mystery still intact on my desk, a forgotten whim of a gift, that tidy anticipation of joy some stranded reminder in a sturdy, miraculous tangle of how we are bound, tied together after all. I'm gonna take a sip of water for a minute. I wrote this next poem back in 1994 when I was still a closet poet, but I've always felt a special connection to it. So this year I dared enter it in the prestigious Lascaux Poetry Contest, never dreaming I'd be competing against 2,500 other submitted poems. You can imagine what a thrill it was to receive real snail mail some eight months later, I nearly pitched it before opening it, to read that I'd been awarded first prize for poetry. Here's the poem. It's called Bliss. In the cool morning, bright hot now from his bath, my child's child leans into my lap, toe-headed hair on fire in the sun. Opening his favorite book to my airy voice, our joined shadows breathe in unison across the morning walls, a shared assumption like shorthand while his puckered fingers grow curious as they waft around my neck, the slightest breeze along my skin. And lost in the familiar, I forget that I'm not his, that my collarbone is not a faultless brink, nor a wishbone ushering him home Instead, absent-minded nerve endings in my chest twinge anew a tidal wave opening from the trickle of his trust. 
If only he could stretch far back into my memories with his steamy mouth as I drink in the bliss. You need to know I have no breasts. Twice removed and gone awry as distant relatives, I hardly mourn them anymore. Like a tree that keeps on falling aimless in the forest when there's no one there to notice. No need to hang around there now, except for dislocated memories. My children understand me well, my sentimental stare, my lingering goodbyes. I still embrace them the same way with my falsies. But as this child stands beside me, his hand a lazy doodle down my bra, how fast a nipple haunts my chest like an imposter, full as gratitude, unquenchable as faith. And suddenly I miss my breast. I miss conforming to this boy's nameless certainty. I miss being the same person as my past. And I am afraid to let his fingers creep more into my hollow for fear I'll scar his confidence with my crumpled scar. So I swallow down the longing, wince from this lovely terror, like waking to a sudden fallen thud within these enraptured woods. The grandson I'd written about this just entered the University of Cambridge this year. I wrote this poem 17 years ago. He still leads me into his enraptured woods all the time. This next poem is about the older side of my family, my husband's parents, may they rest in peace. It's called, It Must Be Lonely There. Swaying, he tries to slip his sweater over a wilted long sleeve shirt and dazzling red suspenders. A bulky task at best, those long woolen sleeves that don't know where to go, whose hand to hold, they flee, won't budge. Each time his fingers dive deep into those gangly arms, they switch and he mumbles skittish words, sounds that quiver in his mouth too closely packed for anyone to understand. Come closer, sugar bunny, she says to him, so I can hear just what you say. Her familiar southern lilt, a counterweight to his weariness. As she moves closer to his unblinking gaze, her arms set free the stumble of his hands. His nearly 90 years, all cornered there, as if he were once again in nursery school. So naturally, she straightens out his collar, soothes the wrinkles on his shirt, her voice a metronome, tidying a tuneless song of order, neat between them. And then they stand there, chest to chest, there, like they always did like it was there, a pure, unbuttoned lifetime. It was waiting for him, like a backdrop, just like she always said, there now. So his hands move outward toward that insistent fog and towards there, towards her, towards the soft denim shirt she always wears. And within the shallow gap, connecting all that unused space between them, a lifetime between them. He tugs her sweater snug around a precious yesterday he found there. One more sip and then I'm gonna read two more poems. The last two poems I'd like to read to you are a bit more abstract, probably coming from the philosopher side of me. They are about my own fragile relationship 
to the human condition. This was just published in the Writer's Circle Anthology series. It's called Talking to Time. Hush time, be still, cling to me, grab my past and pull with all your might. Hug me forward, slow and confident as rain on water, become a frozen sunset, a heart-shaped galaxy expanded. Time, don't be so eager to get going. Let me boss you around. Let me take you for granted. Let me forget how much you count with your endless start and stop. Quit measuring everything. Quit eavesdropping on my body. Remember, later, keep someday a jar. Be home, waiting at the entrance to my hopes. Be gathered there, intimate as breath, invisible as wisdom, fierce as your power over all that sprawling life you shoulder. No matter matters more. Remain bottomless, my unbroken vessel. Contain me more and more. Stay fast on my side. Let me become more of me. Hang on to me and I will bear the rest. The last poem I'm going to read was published recently in the London Reader. It's called Starting Over. Starting over is a furious faith. It means digging your garden once more after a winter of ice has bled the sleeping sap dry. Ice that held everything so still you didn't dare move for fear of cracking tears into splinters with no way to know if an unsmiling freeze would seal up the soil tomorrow. When you start over after an ending, after its long shadow of dread, each garden finds a new start by turning over frozen shit. You burrow through lanky roots more withered than branches. Your fingers picture the difference between which buried shoots are exhausted and which dry tendrils you'll fight for each time. Your cold fingers gut it out in those roots until you save what saves life. You learn not everything that thrives survives. Starting over ignores an ending. The end you imagine looks more like hope. This year, my garden will feel at home in its time-worn body of soil. This year, <clears throat> my garden will wake itself out of despair with the wet sense of narcissus, with crinkly skins of pale buds. They will know enough to hold on when a purple sky shakes them with thunder. They will open up floppy petals to the trespass of curious ladybugs and foraging bees. At sunset, dawdling clouds will mirror their colors. And then, once more, when long-legged stems of autumn collapse into fossilized figures under the weight of crisp nights, I may finally have started to know no matter what you try to save, don't count on the same garden next year. Find more, always more to live in this world and start over after enduring no matter what winter wants. Thank you. I'll turn this back over. Thanks, Jill. Next up is Stephanie Russell. And Stephanie is the former co-editor of Princess Tarda and the 52nd City Literary Magazines. Uh, Stephanie's had a long career in journalism 
and she's but she's currently on the faculty at John Burroughs School. Steph is a member of Poetry Scores, an arts collective devoted to translating poetry into other media, and the Otis Nebula Literary Syndicate, a publishing project that's operated by working writers that's dedicated to serving lip, uh, dedicated to serving the living word, sound, and image to which commercial concerns are always subordinate. And in that, she is a lady after my own heart. <laughs> and so now without further ado, and uh, if her cat will allow it, we'll present Stephanie Russell. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, the cat was all up in my business earlier. She may come back and you'll get to see literal cat herding during a herding cats show. So I think she's sitting on the heater, so we're good now. So thanks to Mike, thanks to Anna and Jill and Treasure and Kevin, who's running ground control for us. And, um, and I think at the end, we should all unmute and give Anna a big woohoo on the new book and Debbie a big collective woohoo on the film. And we can, we can do a, a smaller woohoo for the rest of us, I guess, right? <laughs> um, so anyway, yeah, I think we're kind of having a green turtleneck moment tonight, uh, like where everybody shows up at work wearing a green turtleneck without prior discussion. I picked a lot of poems that remind me of family too and friends. Um, so yeah, because last year, this time last year, I was on an Amtrak train heading for Salt Lake City. Uh, sitting across the aisle from these two guys, a dad and a son, who between the two of them drank about 50 cans of beer. And the dad offered me some homemade deer jerky straight out of his coat pocket. And then they got thrown off the train in a Ottumwa, Iowa, I think it was. Um, and, you know, so I was like very, even though they got thrown off early, I was very glad to get to Salt Lake. And I, I had this moment driving around downtown Salt Lake when, it, and it was snowing and Wilco's uh, Ode to Joy came on the radio and I just started blubbering <laughs> like a baby. Uh, I just had this feeling like a meteor was headed to earth or something, just doom and sadness. And I guess, you know, it wasn't a big spooky meteor. It was like this little bitty thing called a virus, which technically isn't even alive, which is so, weird but anyway so I've been thinking about that Amtrak trip not the beef jerky guy my family <laughs> if this hadn't hit I would be there now and I just really you know I miss everybody so um, but my family buckle up um, so this first one uh, my grandfather was in the circus he played in the circus band and so I have a circus poem it also has a Christmas window, which makes it vaguely seasonally appropriate. <laughs> so I will read that to you. And this poem doesn't have a title. It's from a sequence of poems with number titles. So this is 34. A long time ago, famous bar kept artists on its payroll, people who built tiny castles and sleighs and elves for Christmas windows. That was back when Famous Bar had a fancy restaurant on the top floor and sold secret recipe onion soup and hosted renowned musicians from all over the planet. One October, they brought in Mrs. Ethel Rommelfanger, formerly Judivine, nee rookie, official organist at the Circus World Museum in Baraboo. Mrs. Romofanger played air calliope, flanked by shaker chimes and a uniphone at the beautiful American festival. She wore a metallic tunic and wooden high-heeled sandals. She played hits off her 1961 record, American Steam Calliope Concert II, Camptown Races, and Happy Birthday. She finished with cuts off her recent self-titled album, including covers of Love Child and Magic Carpet Ride. Billboard's circus trooping column gave that record four stars, she told us. It ran next to ads for actual circus work. Cole Brothers sought a winter season fortune teller, 
Buckeye Circus needed a menagerie man to drive a hitch with white mules. Rudy Brothers announced it wanted a second elephant man. Ethel coughed. Not that kind, she said. He means a day laborer, a guy who works with elephants, a reliable and sober guy who can drive a truck. Ethel told us it was harder and harder to run away and join the circus. She said this as a faithful reader of Billboard's final curtain section, which ran death notices of notable circus folk, including Tito Flint, the clown, George Lake of Lake Brothers, Penny Arcades, and Kelly, the candy man, veteran concessionaire. She told us she played even the happy songs like funeral hymns now. She tried to play a funeral hymn for the circus itself, but, you did it to pro but if you did it proper, there'd be a brass band playing Carl King songs and a choir of clowns without makeup and a secret show person's version of Abide With Me with lyrics about stomped on cotton candy under the bleachers after the lights go down and trains rolling on to the next town forevermore, forevermore, accompanied by a wistful bearded lady playing the harmonica playing that harp with all the sadness of the ages, like she was trying to play those notes in the same pitch as the cold rain falling outside tent flaps on the last day of the last circus ever. So that's also uh, an ode to my, my bawling drive around Salt Lake last winter, but things are getting better. Things are gonna get better. And then this is, these are from this weird little book I made a few years ago, and these are just all poems about, well, there, there was an exhibit where there were photographs and then I did an ekphrastic poem for, um, for the photograph, but it really was just a bunch of friends taking pictures and writing poems <laughs> for each other. Um, this one's called, this one was for Jenna Bauer, it's called Still. The white roots of the grass knit together into a veil that lives underground. Somewhere, they say, a girl engaged to the winter will wear it if winter ever comes. Up here under the horse chestnuts with a nimbus of chestnut hair where the green eddies away from the center of everything and bird song takes shape of razor wire though its color is the color of water. The sibylline woman dreams the down below as an endless chalkboard shining with drawings of animal bones empty shells, lost rings, stones. I miss, I miss being around people, can you tell? <laughs> uh, so this one, this one, this one, this was for Matt and Marie McInerney, who are in Kansas City now. Um, this is called, uh, and they're both, uh, Matt's a musician and um, Marie does fabric stuff. She used to dye, uh, stuff for opera theater and um, different theater companies around town. Uh, and Jenna does a lot of stuff. She's a great visual artist and a musician and wonderful human. Butterfly Loop. In the dark room, tracing alphabets with a lit match. Stockinette stitch, dotted Swiss, the affable taffeta twist, the pattern spangled under bluing skies. A roaring aurora stippled with rose atoms of matter. Egyptian dye, red the pharaoh and red in Pompeii. Red Corinth and Charlemagne. Twined older than those we two. Swash letters flourish in gold. And this is for Carmelita Nunez who makes beautiful pottery that I'm sure a lot of people here have seen. Um, this is called Spirits. The rabbits tremble in spiky blue grass as locusts buzz. Drawn in chalk near the hopscotch, a muzzy brown hair with a bubble pipe is puffing and puffing. Bubbles of chalk drift over the walk, sticking together and rabbits form as drifting circles constellate. A toothy dog waves his bubble wand and licks his chops as pink eyes open. Carmelita has, uh, she does rabbit stuff. So. Uh, and this one is for Eric Woods of Firecracker Press. And it's of course called How It Explodes. <laughs> one, color. Littering willow in lemon and green glitter. 
reading color peony, crackling rose garden, 40 shot powerhouse of absolute whirling white, galactic rainbow, fire invincible, 13 inch flaming wheel of destruction gives way to the blue and starry diadem, dragonflies welcome spring this side up. Two, shapes. Roll the tubes with black flash powder, aluminum shavings just for sparkle, bundle up by the hundreds in glassine packets, sew together with raw match, banger, cracker, waterfall, blue comets can only be rolled by hand. The effect is a large star rising. Brocades burn longer than stars. Three, type. Supercharged magnesium and plastic, clustering bees rocket loudest available by law. Do not store in pocket. Ne pas porter dans vos pochets. Supercharged, super strength, extra noise. Light fuse, haul ass and run. Moon travel with report. So I don't know. I guess this is true for everybody. My friends have always been like a second family for me. So this one, <laughs> this one will not seem seasonally appropriate, but uh, my sister makes uh, a, a cameo appearance in this one. So I am deeming it a holiday poem because I think the thing that made uh, my Christmas last year was binge watching the first season of The Mandalorian with my sister. That's the sister that makes uh, the ca a brief cameo appearance in this poem. Uh, so this is called Suburban. Oh, and this, I'm very embarrassed about this. I have to admit to this, I'm reading it on my phone. And apparently po poets who read poems on phones are called poets. I learned this a couple of years ago. My uh, printer is on the fritz, so I am a situational poet. I know a lot of people can't stand it when people read on phones, so I'm being, I'm, I'm doing this with the utmost of clarity. <laughs> so this is my last poem. It's for my sister. Well, the main gist of it isn't for my sister, but she makes a, a nice little appearance at the end. Um, this is called Suburban Witches I Have Known. One, first one I remember, the girl at the end of our block who wore her pet snake on her wrist as a bracelet till it bit her on that big vein where your pulse ticks. Her brother spent a lot of time up in the park, hair hanging in his eyes, digging holes for no one and for no good reason. Two, then there's this one sneaky witch I see her in her velvet jumper, roaming the world in a car filled with kids and dogs. She writes sigils and dish soap on the kitchen counter, then wipes them away. She makes star water and hides it behind the Zinfandel. She protects her phone by texting herself emoji spells, crystal ball, unicorn, blue flower. You might see her at Family Dollar, stocking up on pink birthday candles and floral water. Four, we were super suspicious of our junior high science teacher. He always went on and on about the bad weather and animal bones. He kept his lunch in the fridge with the dead frogs. Once in the back room, we caught him talking to himself. It runs in the family. It runs in the family. I'm doomed to be the leader of a feral cat choir. Five. A warlock I met once, a widower, had this stunk to his fridge. Love spell for a man. Two parts freshly mown grass, one part black glitter, one part bacon fat, dash of root cologne. Stir all ingredients together vigorously. Encant over bowl, decant in brown bottle. Store in fridge near raw red meat for seven days. Apply as needed. Six. This mom at our play date said, only nerds knit curses into sweaters these days. She swiped through pictures on her phone, a pork chop marinated in some charmed sauce, conversation hearts she cooked from scratch, cursive with stuff like, you will believe me. I used a brush with one hair to write those, she said. So easy. After they cool, take them off the parchment, 
point and say, ordinary candy, turn into lucky candy. Seven, my sister's like, seriously, how do you even know so many witches? There's always two or three around, I said. You just don't look very hard. Please allow me to keep pointing. And that is what I have for y'all tonight. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. Okay, now batting in the cleanup position. <laughs> Mississippi native Treasure Shields Redmond is a published poet, master educator, community arts organizer, and a successful entrepreneur. Treasure was raised in the federal housing projects and went on to be signed to MC Hammer's label as a hip hop artist and a writer. She is the author of CHOP, a collection of Quonsabas for Fannie Lou Hamer. Her doctoral research focuses on the recorded performances of foundational Black women poets and the ways that they develop sound to impact the canon and the justice movements. Treasure Center's collaboration in her personal arts practice and as an organizing principal. As such, she has co-founded a funding collective for Black artists called The Black Skillet and a podcast that centers on voices of color called Who Raised You? Treasure is the founder of the Feminine Pronoun Consultants, LLC, and the Get the Acceptance Letter Academy. Ladies and gentlemen, with no further ado, Treasure Shields Redmond. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Um, it is so good to be here this evening sharing poetry. Um, as my esteemed introduction introducer said, my name is Treasure Shields Redmond. Um, and I have to tell you that the poems I'm going to read tonight are a little coronavirus haunted. <laughs> I'm sure that um, this pandemic has seeped into all manner of art practices. I'm sure that the sculptors are making little coronas and the uh, quilters are quilting masks. <laughs> even though I don't know how effective a quilted mask might be. But um, um, yeah, so I want to start off by going to an earlier play. So um, I had a very good friend who died as a result of complications from HIV. And if you all are old enough, you'll remember a time when we didn't know much about AIDS, we didn't know much about HIV, and we thought you could get it from hugging and casual contact and kissing and being in the same classroom and passing each other and breathing the same air. And it caused all manner of discrimination and fear. And to add to it, so many of the victims of HIV were queer. And it just added to uh, the kind of simmering homophobia that exists in the US. In some ways it has improved, but in other ways, not so much. This poem is, um, about my, my good friend, Matthew. And I thought I had already pulled it up. Where is it? Yes, I did. All right, so um, it's called Matthew. None but the righteous, none but the righteous, none but the righteous. Yeah. 
Matthew. It was five years past the first wave of the Michael Jackson phenomenon. You were still wearing your red and black thriller jacket, your high water pants over white socks that were too thick for your penny loafers. A husky football player said, hey, Michael, your reply with a snap, just beat it. You could quip and quote niggas into submission, like the time we was in class and some boy told me to suck his dick. And you said, that's the line I'd like to be in. <laughs> All he could do is fall out of your eyes, pack up his untried manhood and sit the fuck down. That is why when you called me on the phone to tell me what I had hoped to never hear, I put a practical face on my voice, listening at the right bend in the revelation and offering advice in the cul-de-sac of it. But when we said bye and I love you foolish, I dropped the phone as if it had grown tentacles, screaming to somewhere inside your biology. No, I was transported to a place where we had all zero converted, where the disease had become so common and benign that it was just like the comedian said, old folks was complaining about their sciatica and their AIDS acting up. But for now, when we talk, I tell you, maybe you should take that trip to Hot Springs and maybe you should forgive your daddy and maybe. At night, the cures given to me in feverish dreams tell me that I must make a gift of some of my T cells, offer you a drink of some of my amniotic fluid, pepper your face with kisses, or let my newborn put his head on your chest. I wonder if I am up to the challenge that when you go home to our small Mississippi town to die, will I come by, feed you your favorite dish of my grandmama's peach cobbler, sit by your bed, spoon feed you, shh, you don't have to say a word. Will I then tiptoe out so as not to wake you after tucking you into thin sheets? Will your satisfied spirit brush past me on the way out, light itself on my hood, just long enough to see me go in my house, and then grow so big that the earth cannot contain it. None but the righteous, none but the righteous, none but the righteous shall see the All right, that, um, like I said, was a poem from an earlier play. And um, I often think about, especially queer Black men who managed to survive uh, becoming HIV positive and remaining alive through to this new pandemic and what they think of the generalized panic um, the feeling of disease being around every corner and the worry that the government won't have an appropriate response to it. It's very interesting. We might want to ask them how they survived it. Um, the next poem was actually written by a group of people um, on Facebook. I asked people to uh, write a poem with me. The post I put was, let's write a poem together. Okay, here's the first bit. 
your you comment with the next line. And here's the poem that resulted. This virus nibbling the edges of the country. This country nibbling the edges of the lessening pods of humanity. The questions infecting minds with no cure in sight. Fear abounds while black folks keep working multiple shifts, praying for overtime, lays waste to the facade, the hypocrisy of the ruling class, smoke and mirrors, bait and switch. The illusion of pandemic sends a frenzy people unhinged, unraveled, bewitched, flesh and dazzle, pimp, and circumstance. The race to win the presidency outpaces complex political theory, a failed lethargic dance. We are the moth, fleeting and momentary, intoxicated by and dancing ever closer to the naked flames. I tried to go back and find the post and I could not find it, but luckily I had already copied and pasted the poem that resulted from that. Um, you know, our esteemed president talked about the multimedia um, possibilities of poetry. And um, I think that that poem is a perfect example of that in that I used social media to put out a call for verse and it was composed collaboratively. This next poem is one that I'm really proud of because I actually debuted it at an earlier reading that we all did together. And the poem has recently been nominated for a pushcart prize. So I am going to actually share my screen because host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, I wanted to share my screen because I, the poem looks different. It's kind of set up like a, like a survey. But since I can't share my screen, I'll just read it. Um. How do you share your screen, Treasure? We can probably do that. Sorry. Uh, the host disabled it, so I don't want to, you know, take up a lot of time for you to figure out, you know what I'm saying, how to dis uh, undisable it. It's fine. Okay. Okay. All right. So um, this poem is called, it's halfway through the school year. And right now, I teach writing for an, an area high school, for East St. Louis Senior High School. And I was given the position halfway through the previous school year. Um, and this poem is about that. Do you love us? That's what they want to know, my heart. Your son play sports? No, he in college. <laughs> oh, he a good guy. Do you love us? They want to know my intention. Your daughter got a phone? Yes, but no phone number. That's weird, Miss Redmond. You burn a lot of incense in your house, huh, Miss Redmond? You like Erica Badu, huh, Miss Redmond? When will you leave us? That's what they want to know, my breaking point. Their broken pencils, broken heart faces, tracing my answers. I can't look away. When will you break your promise? They want to know my story. The movie of my life will be about getting out of this city, Miss Redmond. The cages of their smiles open often, but only half laughs escape. You can't just give it all away, Miss Redmond. 
you married Miss Redmond. Will you help us? That's what they want to know, my strength. Their heart, heavy bodies move from class to class. I can't see past lunch, Miss Redmond. Does this place exist at night? I'm someone else, Miss Redmond. What about you? They want to know who I am. I'm your new English teacher. The year is half over. They half believe me. All right, I am going to read one more poem. So let me figure out what that is. <laughs> All right, so we're going into the holidays and Christmas, Hanukkah and Kwanzaa are important celebrations during this time. Kwanzaa is an African-American harvest festival that takes its roots from Swahili culture in East Africa. Kwanzaa has seven principles and happens for seven nights after Christmas, ending on New Year's. Every night you light a canara and you give handmade gifts. One of the principles is Imani, which means faith. So I'm going to read a very, very short poem. It's actually a Kwansaba, which is a form that was developed by my father, poet, Eugene Redmond. And it's called Imani. Stuff of hope, proof, of things unseen, like a Dogon star, spirit mapped before masses, NASA even pimped past Galileo. Yo, Miss Imani and her brood make food for brain and heart, but spirit treats be her main feast, fetting faith's first fruits for the creator in us all. Thank you. Thank you, Treasure. Thank you to all four of our poets tonight. Um, on behalf of Herding Cats, I wanna wish everybody a great holiday and um, and a quick end to this damn plague. Good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs>